The GSGA is excited to welcome Dr. Wayman to speak this morning. <clears throat> graduate as well as a 2007 graduate of Duke Divinity School. He completed his PhD from St. Louis University in 2011 and here at Greenville he is the Andrews Chair in Christian Unity as well as an assistant, assistant professor in theology. We are happy to have him bring the message this morning. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Wayman. <clears throat> Good morning. It's good to be with you guys. It's good to be with you. Thank you, GSGA, Jonah, Jansen, the crew, Kyle. Thank you, Gospel Choir. As my youngest son would say, let's do that all the days. All the days. So I'm wearing a hat. Adam said I respect you for wearing the hat of losers. It's been a painful weekend for me. I stayed up through the 18th inning to watch the Dodgers win. I thought that might, you know, be a sign of some kind of uh, new direction. Turns out it was just a fluke. It took us 18 innings to pull one win away from the Red Sox. So I'm kind of in a bit of mourning. Also, it's the end of baseball season, so that's, that's a bit painful for me. Uh, but we got a lot of other great sports going on right now. Basketball season's kicked off, both on campus and in the NBA. We got a lot of fun stuff ahead of us. And, you know, I want to take a minute right here to recognize our teams on campus our women's volleyball team, our women's soccer team, our men's soccer team. Yes, men's soccer. I see you guys in the back. <laughs> yes. All made it to the tournament. That's fun. So we got a lot of fun games ahead of us. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Coach Tom Ackerman, he's our athletic director. He says that over 50% of you all are in sports. That's pretty cool. This is a great time for me to be at Greenville University because I love sports. And one of the reasons why I love sports is that sports provide a platform for improvisation. Sports provide a platform for, for improvisation. So even last night, as the Dodgers went down in the first inning, I was hoping for some kind of improvisation that might squeak away a win from the Red Sox. The Red Sox are just a better team. But that doesn't mean that they'll win, right? The best team doesn't always win. So the best players are master improvisers. And I want to show you what I mean by that. I got a clip that I'm going to pull up here in a second. First of all, I need a baseball guy to help me through this. Do I have a baseball guy that feels comfortable providing some kind of commentary? Joe. Now, oh, Joe's up for it. All right. All right. <clears throat> Why don't you come on up here, Joe? See, where I come from, whoever volunteers someone else, they get to come up. Yeah, but what the heck? Well, you came up so willingly. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. All right, so at the end of the National League Championship Series with the Dodgers and the Brewers, the Dodgers are at Milwaukee. And in the first inning, Christian Yelich, that punk from California, goes yard. He's a great player. Great player. So they go up one zip. Do you know what I'm talking about? You were watching the game. Okay, you're aware of this. Okay. So in the second inning, the Dodgers come up. And my boy, Manny Machado, comes up. He works the 2-0 count. And then he has a couple bad, bad swings. He, he has a ball in the dirt outside and then a change up away. 2-2 two -two count. Battles a couple out. Gets a full count. And it brings us to this. So I'm going to show you the clip. And then I want you to point out to us why he's improvising here. So what's so special about what he did? Machado takes a couple of phantom swings, the pitch. He bunts it up the third baseline, and it's going to be a base hit. Manny Machado with the bases, or not the bases loaded, but a full count leading off the second inning, and he bunts for a base hit. Well, a couple of things were unorthodox so you're gonna get about some that. Clues First here. of all, bunting with two strikes on a 3-2 count. The other thing, too, is... Shasin went with a quick pitch. He did not go into the windup. Multi-talented Machado. Once He's getting booed like crazy. Can you hear that? Second. Shasin. That is hammered into right. <laughs> home run off the bat of Bellinger to put the Dodgers on top. That's the go-ahead run. 
that run will be the determining factor for the Dodgers to knock off the Brewers. A bunt and a blast, and the Dodgers lead by one. Okay. All right, so Justin. That one was Joe. absolutely All right. Crushed. See, I'm thinking Justin Turner. Middle I'm to thinking middle I'm all in Dodge I'm going to exactly take this off. Can you tell us what was Shashin unique about it. that? Now, now, whether he likes Manny Machado or not is beside the point. He doesn't have to defend Manny Machado. Okay, so what happened here? Well, um, one, bunts are usually not happening with nobody on. Okay, so nobody's on base. Okay, any bunts anyway. What else? Three-two count. Three-two count. So what's so, important about that? If you were to bunt it and it go foul, he's automatically out. He's he doesn't out. Even get a chance to run down one. Exactly right. So those are two significant things. No one's on base. He bunts with two strikes. He'd get out if it was foul. Mm -hmm. What else? Anything else? Um, this one's a little bit trickier. He quick pitched. You got it. So nice. You're the right guy. <laughs> Yo. Okay. So what happened? What's a quick pitch? You kind of uh, start earlier, so you come set. And usually you pause for a little bit, and then you start your wind-up. But he just kind of comes set real quick and just goes to, <laughs> to take off the timing of the hitter. Yes. Yeah. And so what does Manny do? He didn't get his timing down, so he just bunted. <laughs> he slaps down a bunt. He improvises. Let's thank Joe. That was perfect. Isaac, that was the right move. That was the right move. He was the right guy. So we got a quick pitch. Manny doesn't have time to get set. He's got to throw down a bunt, and he gets a base hit. Next pitch. Well, it wasn't next pitch, but next batter, Cody Bellinger, goes deep. Love him or hate him, Manny Machado is a great player. Here he is improvising, and in sports, what we, see, we see this differently in sports, right? We say, find a way to win. That's the kind of language we use. Find a way to win. That's the language of improvisation that we use in sports. Basketball isn't just about scoring points. It's about scoring more points than your opponent. Right? Find a way to win. So sports provide us with all kinds of different situations and scenarios. They give us all kinds of different offers. Maybe you face a team that full court presses the full game, plays the whole team, runs you ragged. Maybe you play on a field that's in bad shape or that has a really odd shape to it like Fenway. Maybe you have a referee that calls soft fouls. Ugh or a referee that only calls hard fouls, okay? Yeah, equally, equally moan. Maybe you have an outside hitter that doesn't miss. In the language of improvisation, we call these different situations offers. And the best players, the best teams, they find ways to receive an offer and they turn it into a win. Now that's what improvisation is all about. It's about receiving situations or offers or scenarios and turning them into a win. In improvisation, you never block. You never deny something. You never say, I'm not going to go play at Fenway because that, that outfield is wonky. Right, improv people? You don't, you don't block. For those of you that, Austin, you do improv, right? Yes? Yes? Yeah, all right. It's all about the yes and. That's what improvisation is all about. Improvisation, what this means is you find a way to keep the conversation moving. You find a way to keep the story going. You arrive at something that's surprising or exciting and satisfying. So let me give you a clip of theatrical improvisation, because that's probably what you guys are most used to when, I hear, when you hear me talk about improv. So let me give you a clip of improv, and we'll see what it I'm talking about here. It has a lot of lessons here. in it. So for example, stop. I've got a gun. <laughs> the gun? The gun I gave you for our wedding anniversary, Eric? How could you? We're not married. Aha. Uh -huh. We're not married is a denial. We've learned our first improv lesson. <laughs> <laughs> very hard. It takes a long time to learn. <laughs> this is the problem with an engineer trying to learn. <laughs> it's, it takes a long time uh, to, to learn the, those basic rules of improv. So why don't you take us through them? And they're in the book. Sure, they're in the book. Because um, I was an improviser at Second City and at a place called the Improv Olympic um, in Chicago. And, and I talk in the book about uh, improv having really kind of changed my professional life and even sort of my worldview a little bit. Um, there are some basic rules of improvisation. When you're creating something out of nothing, the, the first rule is to agree, which is to say yes, which we did do that successfully. You said, freeze, I have a gun. And I, I didn't say, that's not a gun, that's your finger. I said, 
Which is what a Google person would say. Yeah. Well, no, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, so we've, we agreed. And the next rule is, is yes and, which is to add on to what you've already agreed upon. So the gun, the gun I gave you for our wedding anniversary, how could you? And then we hit a brick wall. Eric. <laughs> But it's a very, you know, it's funny because it's very, very, some very famous comedians have, there's an old story about Joan Rivers was at the Second City briefly in 1959, 1960, and, and um, there's a, they use this in class at Second City all the time that there was someone came in, you know, said, I, I want a divorce was the beginning of the scene. She said, I want a divorce, and whoever was with her on stage said, but what about the children? And she said, we don't have any children, which in the moment got a big laugh. But stops. But killed the scene. Um, so that's, uh, it's a very... So my response would be... Human instinct. Yes, we have children. I just didn't tell you. That's why we're getting yes. divorced. Yes. <laughs> I have some other children. Yes. This is exactly what, yeah. So you don't block. You keep the story going, right? And that's what improvisation does. It takes a lot of practice. That's what Tina Fey said. Improvisation takes a lot of practice to do it well. The best athletes improvise. So today, what I want to propose is that discipleship is all about improvisation. Improvisation, and that's because improvisation is what Jesus was all about. He was a master improviser. Jesus always found a way to receive an offer or a situation or a scenario and make it into something true and beautiful. As followers of Jesus, our discipleship is also about impro improvising and showing the world the truth and the beauty that God makes possible. So here's what I want to do this morning. First, I want to read a story about Jesus and show how he's improvising. Second, I want to offer you a framework for thinking about your own improvisation, your own discipleship. And then finally, I want to make a couple suggestions for what it would look like for you all to improvise here at Greenville. Cool? Three things. Hopefully we got enough time to do it. So let's start with Jesus improvising. So this Wednesday is Halloween, All Hallows' Eve. Uh, which is the day before All Saints Day. That's the day that the church sets aside for those who have gone before us, those who have died. So it's a, it's a time that we set aside to pray for and honor those who have died. What the church is doing is it's setting aside time for us to think about how God in Christ has received the threatening offer of death on a cross and turned it into salvation for the world. So the gospel lesson for this Wednesday that the church all over the world will be, will be reading in their places of worship is from John's gospel. So it's John chapter 11, verses 32 to 44. I thought we'd, stand, we'd start there for our story about Jesus. And sure enough, we see him improvising. So I didn't even have to go far. Right here for reading this Wednesday, Jesus is improvising. So let me give you some context for the story we're about to read. So there's two sisters. They send word to Jesus and they say, our brother Lazarus, whom you love, is, is ill. Please come and save it. Please come and help him. So what Jesus does is he delays. He delays two days. Then he decides to go see Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And he knows that Lazarus is already dead. He's been dead for four days, in fact. And so Jesus is met, Jesus is met first by Martha, and now he's met by Mary. So in my tradition, what we do is we stand when we read the gospel. So I'd like to invite you all to stand right now, and I'll read it to you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. <clears throat> Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, 
unbind him and let him go. Please be seated. I love this story. Unbind him and let him go. So let's look at Jesus' words and his actions in light of improvisation. So first, the offer, the situation that comes to Jesus, comes in the words of Mary. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And there's a second offer that comes that's a lot like it. It's in the same kind of spirit. And it comes by the question of the Jews. Couldn't this guy who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this guy from dying? Same kind of offer. So the offer is clear. Lazarus is sick and Jesus is a healer. Why didn't you heal him, Jesus? That's what you do. That's the offer. And here's where Jesus improvises. Jesus' improvisation gives us a sense for what it means for us Christians to improvise. And it's a slight tweak on regular improvisation. Of course we say yes and because we want to keep the story going. But our job is not merely to accept every offer that comes our way. Our job, rather, is what Sam Wells, theologian Sam Wells, calls overaccepting. I got a, here's a description of it here. So Sam describes overaccepting as accepting in the light of a larger story. And for Christians, that larger, larger story is what God has done throughout time and what God will do, right? So the story Mary and the Jews were working with is one in which illness leads to death and death rules the day. That's the story they're working with. Jesus has proven that he can heal. And so their offer is for him to be a healer. But Jesus keeps the story going in a surprising and exciting and truthful and absolutely beautiful kind of way. He says, take away the stone. And with a loud voice to a stinking dead man, he says, Lazarus, come out. And he does. Jesus takes the pain of our world, our world of sickness and death, and he makes it into something beautiful. He raises Lazarus from the dead. This raising is a precursor, of course. It's a foretaste of what Jesus will do in light of the threatening offer of crucifixion. He overaccepts it. He turns it into salvation for the world. You'd think that, that Jesus would want to block crucifixion, Right? That's like the worst thing we could possibly do, kill God. But he overaccepts it and turns it into salvation for the world. Jesus conquered death. Jesus' improvisation shows us that he's, a, he's not only a healer, not merely a healer. He's a savior that has power over death. Now granted, we're not Jesus. We're, not, we're likely not going to raise anybody from the dead anytime soon. So what does it look like for us as disciples to improvise, to become master improvisers. Now, what I'd like to suggest is what's called a five-act play. I can't believe how little time I have right now. I gotta, I gotta move. So the five-act play. If you can figure out where you are in this five-act play, improvisation makes all the sense in the world. So here we go. Act one, creation. That's where you start the story. In the beginning, God creates. There's so much love in the Trinity that it just overflows into creation. Act two is Israel. Israel is the story, is a love story. It's a story about Israel falling in and out of love with God, and God is always faithful. The question is, will Israel become the kind of holy people that are capable of friendship with God? Act three. So again, it's a five-act play. Act one is creation and fall. Act, and the fall is how we misuse our freedom. Act two is about Israel, the love story. Act three is the center of the drama. This is where all the important stuff happens. This is where the author enters into the drama and does everything that's important. Jesus conquers sin and death and the devil. Our theology is way too small if it's just about sin. Christ conquers death and the devil. That's act three. All the important stuff has taken place. Act, act five is the end of the story. Christians call it, the, theologians call it the eschaton. It's the last things, the end times. That's when God will make everything turn out right. In this in-between time is act four. This is where we are. This is where the church is. It's in this in-between time that we're called to improvise. And what improvisation essentially means is it's our calling to be faithful. It's not our job to make things come out right. It's not our job to, to be a success or be effective or to win. Why do we need to win? God has already won in Christ. So in this in-between time, we have the freedom of improvisation. 
we're riffing off what God has done in Acts 1 through 3. All right, I got to move here. Let me just skip through this stuff. We improvise and so on and so forth. So here's what we do. Since Act 3 has happened, and this is from Sam's improvisation, since Act 3 has happened in Christ, Act 5 is the fall, we can afford to fail. It's okay if you fail. We can afford to make mistakes because we trust in Christ's victory and in God's ultimate sovereignty. The failures of the church point all the more to, the, to our faith in the story and its author. All right, so let's move to what improvisation looks like for you guys. I'm, I'm like way speeding through this, but we just need to. So the first bit is this. Um, Kayla, you got it queued up. You guys already know how to improvise, and I want to applaud you right now. You have accepted the offer of come to the table, and you have over-accepted it with Africa. Yes. Nice move, you all. <laughs> yes. You guys know how to do this already. You know how to improvise. So this is what it might look like on campus. Over-accepting respect and dignity. So on Thursday night, Mosaic Student Association and Michael Gonzalez and Dana Smith hosted an event where we talked about sexual harassment and sexual assault. The offer is for, for us to be a more civil and safe place. We started leaning in a direction of overacceptance when we started thinking about becoming a kind of community where assault and harassment becomes unthinkable because of how well we love each other. Because we treat everybody in the image of God. We don't have to watch our mouth. We don't have to keep our hands to ourselves because we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's overaccepting. Second, overaccepting. Overaccepting sports. So your coaches here are Christian. They know the big story. The big story is friendship with God. It's not tournaments. It's not championships. It's friendship with God. That's what we want to lean toward here as a community. So that's my prayer for you. Following Jesus is the most exciting, satisfying, truthful, and beautiful adventure you will ever say yes to. I promise you that. And let me be clear, a life of discipleship, of improvisation, is anything but dull. And it's actually really risky. It will provoke the world against you. Be ready for that. It will take every bit of courage and commitment that we together as a community of faith can muster. But this is the only game worth playing. I hope you'll join the team. You're dismissed.